Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to night six of Plenary Tracker, bringing you news and insights from the Plenary Council from the Australasian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn. My name is Genevieve Jacobs with you tonight from the lands of the Wiradjuri people, whose elders and traditional ownership I acknowledge, and the elders of the places from whence you join us. We've had a terrific run of plenary trackers, all intended to get people talking about the major church issues that are and sometimes aren't part of the council proceedings. Please post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and our moderator, Tracy McEwen, will bring them to us tonight. Let's have respectful engagement. Let's ask questions that truly take us somewhere useful. Certainly be robust, be critical, but ask something meaningful. James is our technical administrator. You can message him through the Q&A screen if you are experiencing any difficulties. Tonight, we're going to talk about one of the major issues that's concerned many of the delegates at the Plenary Council, if not so much the actual agenda, and that is the inclusion and the exclusion of women in the church. But first, here's today's Plenary Council news. The Plenary's First Assembly is now entering its final 24 hours of deliberations and today Archbishop Tim Costello further refined what happens from here. The Archbishop expects to publish reflections and proposals from the 10 discussion groups within a couple of weeks. He says the steering committee will consult widely to refine these down to propositions for the Second Assembly to vote on next July. Look, there's a feeling among some Catholics typified by comments from a concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn member, Marilyn Hatton, that discernment can't go on forever. And many in the rainbow community and women would say that now is the time for full equality and synodality. Member Professor Dermot Nestor echoed this sentiment from his group saying, an action plan is itself a prayer. Going forward, John Warhurst in his blog called on the bishops to encourage diocesan media to report diverse Catholic views on reform. Francis Sullivan in his blog feels the plenary is caught between nostalgia for the old order and the challenges of facing the new. And he hopes that tomorrow will give some real direction. Let's go now to our first guest this evening. Our plenary council member today is Virginia Burke. Virginia is a lawyer and consultant. She's chair of Mercy Health and a director of Caritas Australia, the Marta Group and Catholic Health Australia. Virginia, welcome to you. Oh, thank you, Genevieve. I've oh, made it to Friday night. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's been quite the week. And Virginia, after a, after a heavy, hard day yesterday and the end of the council approaching, how did today feel for you? How, how are deliberations unfolding? Oh, well, today I think we, ha we had a sense that we had to get on with it. Um, and there's been some anxiety about how we're going to get to the point of these proposals because it is sort of a structured discernment process that we've been through and there's been a lot of terrific discussion, but it's another thing, isn't it, to come up with proposals that you can get generally get consensus on. So that's, you know, the point we're all at. Um, but look, on the whole, it's been, um, it's been a very intense week. There's no doubt about that. Um, but um, I think um, quite intriguing as well to see how we can get ourselves to this point of proposal. So I'll be so interested to hear tomorrow, you know, where all the groups are at. Um, I've certainly found it, um, look, if you were ever in any doubt about the diversity of the Catholic Church, you know, the plenary council is one way to cure that. So, you know, it's this extraordinary diversity of view, but it's um, a great deal of respect and a lot of goodwill over the whole week, even in amongst robust discussions. So I think that's a positive aspect for me. Um, just to go to some of the, the uh, issues in your introduction, whether it's enough action for people, I'm, I'm not sure. It, 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 I think I'm struck by the, the size and the weight of the, of, the, of the church and all of those views and how can we sort of push it forward. But nonetheless, I, I have felt it's been significant to have a group of women with clergy, with the bishops, all together, even the, the virtual environment for all its limitations, it's sort of a leveller as well. I don't know if you, people might have had that experience just in you know ordinary life. We're all just tiles on the page, if you like. I felt people really did speak up. And our concerns about, or some the concerns I had that you know real issues would not get a run, that, that hasn't happened. Real issues have come through, and I hope that's come through the public. Um, the public live streaming parts of the council as well. Mm. So uh, we've had, had that sense that for some people, the discernment just seems to go on and on. For others, there's a sitting with that and a trust that, that something will 
come out of this that's perhaps unexpected but but worthwhile and wonderful how optimistic are you i i would say i'm hopeful that the process is actually driving us somewhere today was actually the the first time i had a sense that we were being synodal in that sense that we were journeying together and we were sort of it, my my group have been talking about governance all week and about you know more inclusive governance and i think i had this experience that oh my goodness i think we are embodying what we are trying to achieve um so look for me that that was a sense of hope um I, i'm realistic about um our situation but I think it was very significant that women's voices were heard this week, have been heard, are being heard. And I think it is really quite significant. There were women sharing sessions. Um, there were a lot of women in our sessions providing technical support and all sorts of different functions. So I, I think that's really significant. I, I, I'm a little surprised by how significant I have found that actually. <laughs> But I think but it, it's um, but it has been um, a, yeah, a source of hope for me. The question around women's participation in the church has really threaded through all of our discussions here in the plenary tracker. I know it's been raised in council itself because it clearly matters to many delegates, and this is the thing that's been flagged again and again. Give me your thoughts on how women could, practically speaking, share in decision making in the church. What what roles are there? Well, I think um, you know many, many of those roles are articulated in the um, the light from the Southern Cross, the report that's um, you know part of the Plenary Council papers, and many people will be familiar with that. But things like accelerating appointments of women to you know the diocesan bodies, um, parish pastoral councils, diocesan pastoral councils, um, and that the terms of reference for those things actually include principles of inclusivity or gender balance. Um, there's roles for women, um, I think, um, or even, even actually it might have been on plenary tracker this week that um, uh, Mary Collo was talking about uh, women in ecc ecclesiastical um, uh, marriage and penal cases being, um, uh, uh, being recognised, you know, canon lawyers. Um, one, one theme that's come through uh, is women as preachers. Um, that's come through quite strongly. And again, that's one that sort of took me a little by surprise how how, how that has come up. Um, certainly women as deacons in the church, you know, is there is there a real barrier to that? While the plenary council itself may not um, be able to make decisions on that, it can make inquiries, it, it can express interest. So they're the kind of roles that I think are possible and they're the roles that have been raised this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting reflection, Virginia. I, um, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that it's only very recently that women have been formally recognised as readers in the church, because the ancient church saw that as the first step towards the diaconate. And, you know, I've, I've always found that very challenging that I was only a substitute until a bloke might come along. Um, yeah, well, I, don't, so you know, I don't think I fully realised that either, and because I, I, I can't think of a time when women weren't doing the reading. So, you know, it's... Um, I don't know. Yeah. But it's formally very recent change. Absolutely, a very, very recent change. You were a substitute reader before that. You may not have realised. Um, so is this about participation, visibility? Is it as much as anything a matter of women being seen, seen actively participating? across the church's language, liturgy, theology and law? Do we need to see it to be it? Oh, yes, I think so. And I think, look, my comment earlier about the significance of the Plenary Council is that, that women are visible, that we are seen, that we are there at the table. So, yes, it is really important. But I think it's also important um, that the structures are there to support it as well, that, that it, you know, it's, re it's really hard to force yourself to the table, as we all know. So I think the structures, and I suppose I've spent a week thinking about the governance structures, they need, they need to be set up in such a way that, that support, um, you know, the, the principles of inclusivity or the things that I've just spoken about. You know, that, that it need, we need to ensure that, that, it, that it happens, um, you know, as a matter of course. Mm. And, and I think that's the point, isn't it? And we've, we've touched on this a number of times across the tracker, that, that it's, it's, it's not simply a matter of that will happen where people are so inclined. It's a principle that we need to move across the church as a whole. You, you need to put 50% of the population in a position of inclusion and visibility. Does this principle of synodality really lend itself to giving a voice to women in the church? I mean, is it a vehicle for inclusion? Well, I, I 
wondered about actually whether could you impose synodality onto our existing church structure. I was quite skeptical about whether that that's really going to work. But I think my experience this week has shown me that that I think it can I think it can work in that it in this idea that it sort of embodies what the where, where you're trying to go to because you're there you're working with other other men other women clergy bishops you're all there and you are working together uh and you're really trying to understand you know each other's positions so I think that you know the listening focus of this week has meant you know you've really tried to understand and I think that that itself means you forge sort of connections so it's valuable from that from that point of view um, but I think the question is how far can it take us? You know, how far can it? And I think that's why I feel curious about what will be the outcomes from this. What will be the outcomes next year when when the plenary councils, you know, make, you know voting on deliberations and so on? So uh, on propositions, I should say. Um, yeah. So I'm not I'm not sure, Genevieve. I think that's I, I think that's my answer. But it seems to be worthwhile exploring it given the structure that we have and the place that, you know, we're trying to get to. So I think, I feel that it is, um, it's a constructive process. So, so what's your hope then, Virginia? Um, we've got this council, then we've got another assembly to go. There's clearly from everything we can read, a real mood of saying the inclusion of women, the full inclusion of women at whatever level we can manage that is something that really matters to the Australian Catholic Church. Yeah. What do you hope might come out of this? I would hope that this plenary council could actually sort of enact those those items. That there that there I hope that there would be sufficient consensus for those to be seriously brought forward in this time. And it's hard it's hard to see what are the you know uh, the barriers for that. Can we get past any barriers that are there? Um, so I think my hope is that these things can be given real consideration in this period. And, uh, um, and also, I, I think I also have a sense that we don't, um, I'm very mindful of the report from 1999, One Woman, One Man, and, uh, and other panellists may wish to talk about this as well, they probably know a lot more about it than me, but, but that's had 20 years, very similar recommendations to what have come through in the light from the Southern Cross, very similar from, uh, recommendations that come through this week. And is there ever a mechanism, can there be a mechanism for us to, to, as a church, to be accountable for those reports? You know, what happens to them? And how can we, how can we make sure that 20 years doesn't go by without us being held to account for what's in those reports? So I suppose that's one thing that struck me. You know, how, how do we do that as a church? It's, it's hard. It's hard for the church to have those mechanisms, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think... Wonderful to hear from you, Virginia, and I, I hope we can all share your optimism that something comes out of this that is a powerful generative force within the Australian church that we find a way forward that everyone can get on board with. Thank you so much for your time. And let's move now to our panel. Andrea Dean is president of WATAC, Women in the Australian Church, and formerly worked in national offices for lay pastoral ministry and the participation of women. Pip McElroy was a participant in the Young Catholic Women's Interfaith Fellowship, now leadership for mission in 2014, and has completed a Master's of Theology. She works for St Vincent's Health Australia. Andrea, in many ways, there is nothing new under the sun if we look at the recommendation from Woman and Man 20 years ago, as Virginia said. Those recommendations cover many of the things that the delegates are concerned about. Just following on from Virginia's ideas, where could we get moving on women's roles in ministry relatively easily let's we'll go in a moment to this idea of you know the the whole ordination question but right here and now without shaking the earth upside down what could happen it's i suppose the consistent theme in the follow-up to woman and man the action plans that were developed focused on greater role for women in leadership decision making and ministry so they were very clear. Obviously, the participation of women in the church is enormous. There are more women there. There are more women at almost every level. But it's at the level of leadership, decision-making and ministry that the doors are closed. So one area where we could immediately make a big impact would be to support the role of pastoral associates, pastoral ministers uh, everywhere, every, in every parish, uh, 
uh, and that could be open to lay men and lay women. But I think based on my experience of working with people in lay ministry, it's a role that's very attractive to, for women and they're very gifted for a role like that. So our experience is that this role has declined significantly in the last 20 years when really it would have been better for the church if it had grown over that time. Mm -hmm. Pip, your thoughts on that? Are there, ex ex for example, more opportunities for women to perhaps contribute widely to the, to the liturgy? Where could we take up roles here and now in that leadership, decision-making, front-facing space? Thanks, Genevieve. And I think um, what Virginia said a little bit earlier resonated with me in terms of being accountable to reports. And not only in terms of being accountable to reports, but also being accountable to what's possible already in the church. I mean, it's funny for me to hear that women readers are in a substitute role. Uh, I'm, it, in, in a sense, it sort of doesn't matter in, in one way, but um, I, I think already there are so many opportunities for women to be invited into more participation. Uh, preaching is just one example, but um, from my personal point of view, it would be wonderful. It'd be wonderful to do that and it'd be wonderful to witness that as an example. Yeah, and, and look, I, I think these things sort of do come as a shock, but this is the, the difference between women being included where people feel like it and women being included because it is the right, inclusive, important thing to do. And I think those are two different things. And because mm. women are often included because priests or bishops are willing is a different thing from saying this matters on principle for the inclusivity of the church as a whole. Andrea, if final decision-making roles are reserved for the ordained, and there's a whole hill to climb there about women and ordination, what are the yes. leadership positions where women <laughs> play a really meaningful role, not only in a parish, but also perhaps at, at diocesan level? Well, again, if you look in diocesan offices and even in national church offices, you will see a lot of women there. But again, it's just that um, kind of the stained glass ceiling that they encounter when so many decisions are then reserved for the bishop or the ordained person. So I guess we still have that kind of blocking effect there. But one way I think around it would be that we really did commit to dynamic diocesan pastoral councils and dynamic parish councils. And why doesn't Australia have a national council for the laity? Three years ago, almost exactly three years ago, I was in Rome at a meeting which was looking at uh, lay formation and um, fortunately, I was sent as one of the Australian representatives, but from Nigeria and the Philippines and South Africa, those representatives came from the National Council of the Laity in those countries. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had that progressive way of involving uh, lay women and lay men at the parish level, the diocesan level and the national level, so we had a voice that was comparable to the National Conference of Bishops and we didn't always have to look for the ordained man to speak for the parish or the diocese or the Australian church, but we had uh, lay women and lay men who were in positions that could, where they really could exercise leadership for the church in Australia. Mm. And we, we spoke about this a night or two ago in the context of governance, about governance being a matter for all the baptised, mm. that, that we all have a role to play in leadership, that we all have a role to play in taking, taking the reins. Pip, how do you see that playing out? I mean, practically speaking, there's the ordination question, but in many ways, no real reason whatsoever why there shouldn't be many more women doing many, many other things before we even go to that question around women and ordination. I think that's right, Genevieve. And I just wanted to make a point on what Andrea was saying about communication in different forms. And I feel quite strongly, I'm so lucky in my role at St. Vincent's, um, working in the healthcare ministry to be leading um, and to be you know, doing my best to lead in an authentic way in a Catholic ministry. And I would really like when the church was making a statement about something that 
uh, involved healthcare or involved something which we have expertise in, that that invitation would always be there to share that responsibility of communication. So I think it's all, it's about inclusion within the, the church um, itself and its ministries too. Um, yeah. And I think it's important to say too, it's not that, you know, we're busting to take over or anything like that. It's like, I suppose it's for the sake of the community. It's to enrich the community. Um, I read uh, an Irish journalist recently talked about, it's like the church breathing with one lung or trying to fly with one wing. It weakens the community when we don't have this uh, openness to the gifts of all. And, and I think that's the point I often make in this context, both within the church and elsewhere, is that whenever you exclude large groups of people, you exclude mm. all the gifts, all their talents, all the human capital that you have within the organisation. Mm. And whether that's a matter of, of, uh, of, of faith, whether it's about education, race or any of the other things that we typically use to exclude people, mm. why beggar ourselves as an organisation of all the things, all the gifts those people have to bring. Mm. Andrew, we, we've heard a few calls from our tracker guests for dispensing with hierarchical markers at the council. And a few mm -hmm. people have flown the flag and said, let's stop with the, the my lord and, and, and the father and the sister. Where could we go with guidelines concerning the use of inclusive language in, in the liturgy, in prayer, the pastoral and social life of the church? How is that another step we could take towards? Well, again, this is kind of obvious, isn't it, that the difference that it makes. So I think 20 years ago, uh, the recommendations, not just in Australia but a, and in other Christian churches, the focus was around inclusive language. And at first that was mainly targeted on, let's be at least gender inclusive because there are many, I suppose, limitations on our English language. So previously, of course, it's been all right to say, you know, all men and people were supposed to know it meant everyone. But so about 20 years ago, that heightened awareness, it was better to say people, uh, better to say men and women, sisters and brothers, I remember you saying to me, Pip, how poignant it, you found it when uh, a priest in leading the liturgy would say, instead of just brothers and sisters, as if the women were a tack on, but to say sisters and brothers sometimes. So just the sense of equality that's possible uh, in language initially as a first step. So we started with that sense of being gender inclusive, but then I think we realised that we wanted to eliminate other forms of discrimination that existed in our language. So it was sometimes an awareness about uh, being more sensitive to words that had racial impact or that maybe had some other prejudice in, in their history. So we tried to be non-discriminatory. Now I think we're really hoping that we could be gender expansive so that we really are as I suppose, exercising hospitality with our language about everybody who's present in the community, but that we also become more sensitive regarding our use of language about God so that we don't always refer to God as father, though that is one rich scriptural metaphor that we have, but that we do realise that God is also the compassionate one, the protector, that God's action is like uh, a mothering hen gathering us together in safety so that we look at all those issues about our language so that we express our faith as richly as possible as well. Mm. It's a it's a fascinating notion, Andrea, and I was thinking as you're speaking, in the Catholic Church, we've always had Marian devotion as an expression of, of attachment to the, the female aspect. But of course, people can be very upset when you refer to God as she, mm, <laughs> mm, <laughs> which mm. is um, which is very challenging for some. Mm. Uh, even broader than language, what about practical support for women training for leadership? I mean, you've mentioned, for example, ongoing financial support of women to complete studies in theology. We've been fortunate to have a number of people as plenary tracker guests who have, um, who have studies in theology. What are your thoughts about how that would encourage this formation for leadership? Thanks, Genevieve. Yeah, I feel really passionate about this one. Um, obviously, in my introduction, I'm a graduate of the 
Young Catholic Women's Interfaith Fellowship and um, was very ably led by uh, Andrea in that. Um, I really can't um, underestimate the influence that being supported to do theological studies in that community and mentored by the other women um, has had on me personally and professionally. And just over and over, I am astounded by the contribution that women um, who are alumni of that program are making um, to the church and the church's ministries. Um, and I guess I'm conscious that there's a lot of resources and there's a lot of finances that are dedicated to the um, academic and otherwise support of, of men um, uh, training for the priesthood, um, including, you know, seminaries that might be kept open with a small amount of people in them or, or um, studies being completed overseas. And so it would be so encouraging for me if I was, if I was to see a real commitment to, to sustainable financial support of women to do theological studies. Um, and I think it's, I guess it's, I think it's more, more than just that issue. I think it's, it has huge ramifications for the whole church, whether that happens or not, um, for its relevancy and its legitimacy. Mm. And Andrea, <coughs> I might throw that back to you, given your long involvement with the Office for the Participation of Women. Surely, as Pip's suggesting, that's one of the ways to facilitate that well-grounded leadership to make sure that women are amply qualified, that there is no question about those things, and they're then empowered to bring their mm. female understanding of theology. Absolutely. <clears throat> and that was, a, that was a wonderful experience for me too. So I was listening to something just yesterday about the power of reverse mentoring. So what it can do uh, for a more mature person to listen to and to be informed by younger people too. So it was very formative for me. So I think that kind of cross age or cross experience relationship is very enriching. But I think um, I, Pip and the other young women who did that program, I mean, they really gave their all to it. So they studied well, they worked well, but they didn't just look on it as like intellectual formation. It was really transformative for them. And it was transformative for them as a group. So as Pip mentioned, they really formed a community. Uh, it was, I suppose it was like a synodal experience for them. They walked a journey together and along the way they were changed and particularly the women who came into the first program that I led, they were so courageous. They didn't know who I was or what style of formation we would have. And, you know, they just came in with such trust. They really only came because their faith was important to them. And so much goodness came out of it, you know, so much uh, growth in their own personal and professional lives. And we all weathered some ups and downs over that time. So I think it's an incredible thing to do to support a group uh, in their theological formation, but ideally to have something like uh, Pip's group experience to not just study and just come in and out of class, but to have that experience of being together, uh, getting to really know each other and to live into that transformation as well. Mm -hmm. And, and perhaps just finally and briefly to you, Pip, um, we've heard a number of times in these plenary tracker conversations about the feeling from some of us that you hang on by your fingertips. You've been working and hoping so long and you keep on hoping, sometimes against hope. What about you as a, as a, a younger Catholic woman faced with the kinds of challenges we've been discussing? Where does your optimism spring from, your willingness to continue to be engaged? You know, Genevieve, I went for a run this morning and I thought about how sometimes at these events it's about women and only women attend. And I felt really deeply that, you know, with my pet participation tonight is accompanying me uh, the priests who have helped to form me and the men in the church who are so inclusive in how they operate. Um, I have been so fortunate in our family parish, in the Jesuit youth ministry that I've been part of, in my professional setting um, and other friends. 
uh, to see the best version of the Catholic Church through them. And I guess I have a philosophy that life is often lived in the grey and that nothing is all good or all bad. Um, and so that's really helpful. But there is just so much good in the church. I owe so much um, uh, personally uh, to my experiences and my Catholic upbringing that, um, yeah, it's, it's just too, too good to give up. Oh, beautifully expressed, Pip. Absolutely <laughs> beautifully said. Look, thank you both so much. Let's move now to questions via our moderator, theologian Tracy McEwen is with us again. She's been one of the moving forces behind the plenary tracker, deeply involved with getting this all working each night behind the scenes. Tracy, what do people want to know? Thanks, Genevieve. There's lots of questions coming through the chat and lots of long questions. So I'm hoping that I can actually do justice to this tonight. Um, I, I wanted to start with something that really struck me in, in what you were all saying tonight. And that was that there's lots that we can do in the here and now. And that's come through in some of the questions with the great ministry work that a lot of the women are already doing. You know, they're, they're already um, involved in ministry, you know, accompanying people um, in, in different ways. But one thing that I found in my own research is that although we've got three and five women in mass, three and five people in mass being women, if we look at women under 40 who are in church communities, we've got two thirds of them with post school qualifications. We've got a quarter of them uh, saying that they have leadership and management skills. A third of them are saying that we want to be, they want to be more involved, but only 1% of them have positions on parish councils or similar. So where does this mechanism to be accountable come in, Virginia? Like, you know, that, um, that mechanism, like, do we need quotas? Like somebody posted in the questions a couple of nights ago, you know, is it okay for women to be chosen on gender, <laughs> on gender for these positions, you know, which there's a slight irony in that. But I, I'm wondering, do we need quotas um, in these parish councils, in parish councils and in diocesan councils if they come through to ensure that we have equal leadership, not just of women, but younger women as well? Thanks, Tracy. I think we need to adopt the principle that we have gender equality on those on those councils, diocesan finance, uh, diocesan pastoral councils, finance councils, parish pastoral councils, and, and whether not necessarily quoted, but I think a 50-50 principle is 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 worth adopting. And I think we've probably proven in the corporate world that it's very slow unless you you make a very active effort to go 50-50. But in the case of the church, those stats that you've just quoted, there are so many women who can fill these positions. So it, yes, it does take effort to invite people in and it does have to be an invitation. Um, but I think we have to adopt the principle and it's in one of the discernment, the publicly available discernment papers that we adopt a principle of um, a 50, 50, a gender equality on all of those um, councils. I, so I think we need that principle and I think it needs to be, you know, you have to, you have to actively um, build those groups up. You need nomination um, committees for example, that, that include women and that include people who are going to make a really active effort um, to see who's out there, to connect who's out there. And this is being done in our, you know, in the ordinary, uh, the business world all the time. And it's a practice that the business world hasn't always got right. It hasn't always included women. So there's a lot to be learnt there about how you do it. And some dioceses I know are already adopting this. They have women involved in these selection processes. And they just have to simply, you know, actively turn their minds to it. And you're right, that these are things that can be done now. Great. Thanks so much, Virginia. I've got a question now for you, Andrea, and um, this has come through the chat. And the concern is that if we just add women and stir, um, so to speak, um, that recipe will not necessarily result in significant cultural change, but rather only include women in a structure where um, the power remains in the small in a small group of clerical men um, what do you think about that so that unless there's a focus on radical change to the existing arrangements of power um, and attitudes to gender and clerical culture um, can change only be minimal 
I guess I've been in situations where I've been part of that, you know, add women and stir. <laughs> and it's tough. I mean, it's not just, yeah, so for the first time to be a woman involved in something, you know, like it's not necessarily going to be a different experience. And often you're going to feel pretty uncomfortable. Uh, I feel a bit like you know, that recent movie about the black women who were the mathematicians on the Apollo project and like they were <laughs> they were kind of hidden, they were well, hidden figures, that's right. It reminds me now of the name. So I mean it was like, you know, they, there wasn't even a bathroom for them to use. And I guess you can if you've added in, you can be there, but like nothing else around you changes. And certainly nobody further out can really feel any change. So yeah, add women and stir. It's not as easy as that. It's a longer, deeper, more thorough approach is required. I don't know all the steps, but cultural change, that's, I mean, there are people who know about that sort of stuff and I think we could learn more about it. Great, thanks so much, Andrea. The, um... Pip, I'm going to put this question to you, and and this is regarding like the career pathway of a of a priest in the in the church. Now, so you know you you know, there's biblical contempl um, contemplation in the seminary. You're living in community, and you're travelling to um, across many dioceses. How could you envisage a pathway that would enable women and other lay preachers um, and and ministers to develop equivalent expertise to enable them to minister and preach effectively? Mm -hmm. It's a good, good question. Um, I guess I go to our responsibility and um, capabilities as the lay baptised that um, we, we sit in the pews and we listen to the word and we listen to the sermons uh, and uh, our experience of our faith is an authentic one. And I guess I feel really open to hearing the female women's perspective on their experience of their, of their faith. Um, and I, I guess when I talk about wanting to hear those voices, even within the liturgy where possible, I'm not expecting that the formation might be exactly the same as a priest. And I think it's probably um, thought by many that that formation needs to be um, developed and changed a little bit too. So, yeah, I, I, I probably think about it a bit differently to the way that the question is asked, if that's all right. Great, thanks, Pip. There's another question that's um, just come through now. So how, um, and I, I might put this you, to you, Virginia, um, Andrew spoke a little bit earlier about inclusive language and this is about women preaching and it's saying how can women be effective preachers in the Catholic Church when the current lectionary retains both horizontal and vertical androcentric language like so we've got you know the brothers and sisters and you know we heard this same kind of language in um, Pope Francis encyclical brothers all um, you know how how can um, while, while we still remain like how can we preach effectively while we still have this language, you know, through not just the mass, but the lectionary as well, the readings that we hear? It's rather intractable, isn't it, in a sense? I'm yeah. <laughs> I thought it, was, it might stump you a little bit there, but it is, it is that kind of, you know, this is so embedded, isn't it? Like, you know, how, how do we, this is across everything. So how, how do we pull ourselves out of that? I think it's when, you know, when you have the opportunity to have any kind of say in, in these issues, you know, we've just heard Andrea articulate the case for inclusive language. I mean, I think that's what you do is when you have that power, when you're at that table and you can influence that discussion, then you take your chance and you do that. But I think wherever you can, um, you, you need to point it out as well. You need to, yeah. to, to claim it, what it is and how it affects you. And I think you're right, you know, talking about Fratelli Tutti, a, you know, a, a wonderful document, which I've really thought about a lot during the pandemic, you know, these ideas of social friendship and solidarity. But when I'm asked to speak about it, I always say that it's, a, you know, that I had to get past the effect that it had on me. You know, there's a resistance there. So I, I think if we can name it, 
maybe that's all we can do at the moment, but it, it does then just sort of raise it for other people that it doesn't have to be this way. Great, I'm sorry, I'm just struggling to, like there's so many questions coming through and it is it is a bit of a struggle to kind of get through one. But I'm, I'm actually just gonna read this one out because um, it's hard to paraphrase. So, um, and I'll kind of all think about it and I'll work out where, it, or we can work out where it goes at the end because it's quite long and that's the issue. There are lots of long questions coming through. The status quo of the current operation of our church clearly is an exclusionary um, model, but the spiritual and temporal scandal, that is the spiritual and temporal scandal of our church in 2021. After all, who has Jesus or God excluded in the creation of the cosmos? Whilst calling out the scandal of cisgender, heteropatriarchal male supremacy is important, is inclusion a solution or an end goal? Isn't the issue of equality, justice, and equitable governance and participation the point of doing church, not just being church? How much money resources goes into funding cisgender, gender, heteropatriarchal, ordained male formative programs? And how much money resources goes into funding, resourcing everybody else in the church, women Catholics, LGBTIQ Catholics, refugee Catholics, Aboriginal Catholics? Anyone want to um, jump in and grab that one? Pip, that's kind of along the lines of what you were saying earlier, isn't it, with regarding the training of people? Um, it might be. I, it's, that, was, that was a long question. I, I, if you'll allow me to say what came to mind, whether it's relevant yeah. or not. Um, <laughs> Virginia was saying before that um, about the experience of synodality in the plenary itself and that it had struck her that they were living that out. And in my experience of um, being a member of one of the discernment and writing groups, I had that same transformative um, realisation. I thought, we're actually doing this. And I had already thought that the process was really valuable in and of itself. So maybe that's something to do with the being and the doing. Um, and I, I sat next to Bishop Bill Wright and I led the group in prayer and I didn't blink. And I thought to myself on the bus home afterwards, wow, I led prayer next to a bishop and didn't think twice. And, you know, that, that might not be enough for some people, but it was really powerful for me. And so I think maybe there was something in there about the process itself being, um, being really valuable um, and in, in how we act and the choices that we make in the, on the way are really powerful. It's not just where we want to get to eventually. Tracy, Great, thanks so much, on? Pip. Yeah, you can add on. Andrea, go for it. So I think the firstly that the writer of that excellent question should join WATAC because we're into <laughs> questions like that. I, I just have a little quote here, which just seems so on point. It's from um, Amy Jill Levine, um, a Jewish a woman who's done a lot to help Catholics understand Hebrew scripture and vice versa. So she, this is a quote from her, the kingdom of God is not a press conference or a resolution or a short course in how to be eloquently indignant. It is a table laden with grace at which the social maps are all redrawn. Jesus' guest list comes straight out of one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I mean, <laughs> this is it. I mean, I think the questioner has really raised a whole lot of important issues there. Surely our issue is not just really about the church and how what money we spend in kind of propping up how things are. Don't we really need to refocus on Jesus and on the gospel and you know, on the kingdom of God and if that's our focus, I think we'll be free to go in all kinds of incredible places, a table Thanks, laden with grace. Thanks so much, Andrea. And I'm just going to put this last question to you, Pip. And, and this is because you're the youngest on the panel here. So, and also you've spoke really eloquently about your experience of church and, and what has kept you there. And I'm one of those ones hanging in by my bleeding fingernails. So I'm quite keen to hear your answer to this one. So this, this question is, in most parishes, there's a lack of numbers of youth, young adult women and men. 
and many Catholics have become disaffected and no longer want have any part of parish communities. Do you have any suggestions about how to reach out and communicate with these people? Thanks, Tracy. Um, it's a good question, and um, I'm very aware that my uh, participation in the church is quite countercultural for my generation, and that's painful at times. Um, I think what occurs to me about the Plenary Council and about this issue of inclusion of women in um, specifically is that it's about so much more than that. Um, people of my age, um, you know, get a whiff of a bit of a hypocrisy and they don't want any part of it. And it's really clear from, uh, you know, impressions that have been collected from young people that if they perceive the church to be less inclusive than the kind of society they want to be part of, they don't want to be part of it. So, you know, a lot of the questions about the Plenary Council have the word missionary in them. If, if we are able to be missionary, we need to be real and we need to be relevant and we need to be in line with societal expectations about women being involved and about being authentic, as Andrea was saying, being radically inclusive like Jesus was. Uh, uh, people know that and people see that the church doesn't always act in that way and they expect it to. And I think we want it to as well. So it's about being in line with our own expectations and that of others. Great, thanks Pip. I'm just gonna park this back to Genevieve to close. Thank you so much, Tracy. I'm taking away with me the idea that around the table that Jesus lays is all the richness, the strangeness, the broken humanity of one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I think that's a fabulous evocation of how important we all are. Mm. Tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about inclusion again, this time inclusion and the rainbow community. Where does the church stand on the faithful who are also LGBTQIA+. Thank you to all of our guests tonight, to Virginia, to Andrea and to Pip. And I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow at 7.30.